book we're about to talk about is called Deliverance. It is a suspense novel in a way, although it's not basically a suspense novel, but it's a very exciting novel laid in North Georgia. It's published by Houghton Mifflin, written by James Dickey, the poet, whose first novel it is. And uh, how did you happen to uh, come up with the idea of doing a novel? Well, um... Because you're basically a poet, of course. Yes, it, it's it's kind of hard to assess that after oh, seven or eight years. I, I believe, I, th I think I can truthfully say that uh, I, w I was lying in, in bed in the middle of the afternoon in Italy uh, once uh, where I was then living, and and I thought of, of a few incidents that I participated in, and... Uh, and uh, conceived in a kind of a vague and hazy way that uh, these might go into a uh, depiction of an action which might be interesting as a novel, and then it just gradually built up out of that uh, rather unpromising uh, idea. Well, I take it you are uh, uh, an expert with guns and bows and arrows, right? No, you? not guns, no. I never pick one up. They scare me to death. Is that right? Bows and arrows, yeah. I can see the point of that. Uh, but uh, and and as I as I went ahead and wrote um, the book, it, uh, the central episode, which is the which is the pitting of a rifleman against a man with a bow and arrow, uh, became more and more uh, important and uh, seemed to seemed to become the central episode of the, of the book, and it, it all began to revolve around that episode. Pardon me for laughing. I'm not laughing at what you said. Yes, I am. I'm laughing at you saying you were afraid to pick a gun up because you were a fighter pilot. Well, no, but that's the airplanes firing the guns then. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's you just touch a button and... <laughs> You're yeah. a fighter pilot, a night pilot, a night fighter pilot in New Guinea, weren't you? Well, yes, I was in New Guinea, I was in, yeah. also in the Philippines, in Okinawa. Yeah and many another place. <laughs> you, you reminded me with that bit about the gun. Anyway, your book, as I said, takes place in North Georgia, and the start of the book, these four friends, well, semi-friends, or a couple yeah, of them are friends. Acquaintances. The other are acquaintances, yeah. yeah right. Are sort of chatting and decide at the insistence of one, the, the physical culture man and, the, yes. and the, the great hunter, to go up to a valley, or a, I guess it's a valley, uh, which is about to be dammed up, Mm -hmm. and flooded, mm -hmm. and to take a ride down this, this uh, rather dangerous river in canoes. Mm -hmm. Have you done that, by the way? Oh, uh, well, I've done that, or something like, like it, yes. And, uh, but, but you see, uh, Lewis, the physical culture man, is, has got a very powerful argument for, for asking these other fellows to do this, uh, which, is, which is part of the most obsessive uh, part of our culture now, which is to see uh, m marvelous wild country before it disappears. Mm. I mean, we all want to do this, uh, and we know it's going to disappear, uh, that, the, that the industrialists are going to move in, and, and it's all going to be gone, and, and we, we, if we don't see it now, we never will be able to see it. They're even encroaching on the, on the parks, aren't they? Oh, yes. Imagine you can get away with those. Yes, uh-huh. So, so I would, I would go with Lewis. <laughs> well, I think you did. I think yeah. you were one of them. <laughs> yes, I'm I did. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but the mountaineers that they run into, and I'm not going to give the plot away, but there is a, as as you indicated, a confrontation between a fellow with a gun or a couple with guns and the people with the bows and arrows. The mountaineers are extremely, a couple of extremely nasty characters. They're, uh, yes, I've, and I've had some mail that says, you know, from people who live in the south in the mountains, and they say, goodness, you're giving us an awful unfavorable representation of mountain people. Really, we are, we are clannish, but we are not all murderous. But, but that, that's like saying that you, if you write a novel about the mafia in New York, you're saying that all New Yorkers are murderous. Yeah. I mean... I mean, there's some rough mountain types, you know. I'm sure there are, and I'm mm -hmm. sure there are some that would almost as soon shoot you as look at rather, you. Rubber, they would rubber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the the uh, the thing builds so nicely because it starts out as a vacation and nice and mm -hmm. easy and calm and everything sunshine, and then mm -hmm. the horror comes in. Did you have to work quite a while to get that effect, or do no, horrors come by this naturally? No, I don't. I don't. No, it it just seemed to, as I as I wrote it, it. One event seemed to lead to another in more or less of a natural fashion, and 
and uh, it just it sort of proceeded on that basis. Did you, did you do research for this? Is there oh, a no. valley? No, what I mean oh, is no. in, in the sense of physical research. Is there a valley anything like this? Yeah, well, the river uh, in the in the novel, the river I call the Kahulawasi, yeah. uh, is really a kind of a composite of three or four different ones I've been down. I think when we do the film, we'll mainly use the Chattooga River, uh, which is uh, forms part of the boundary between Georgia and South Carolina. But it's also, uh, the Kahulawasi is also partly the Takoa River and also the Kusawati, which ro runs like like the Kahulawasi from northeast to southwest down through the northern part of the state. It's a funny collection of names. Are they all Indian names? Well, uh, my, my name, the Kahulawasi, is a is a made-up Indian name. That <laughs> but I mean, the <laughs> others you mentioned. The others Indian, are real so. Indian names. Yeah. <laughs> But the, the uh, that's what I meant by research. The physical background does have some, some resemblance or some basis in fact. Well, but, but research implies that I went up there with the intention of writing a novel about these things when it was really very much of an after-the-fact thing. You mentioned uh, letters from the Mountaineers. Have you had a pretty good reaction? Now, the book is selling very well. It's on the bestseller list. Well, it's the number one in Chicago now. That's fine. And, That's fine. and uh, oh, yes. It's, I'm surely, surely very gratified at the reception. Goodness. But, I mean, your letters, uh, aside from a couple from the Mountaineers, have not been at all uh, upset. There's some. No, no. They're the very, very nice letters, indeed. And gracious, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything more gracious than most of them. Well, now, you're not about to desert the field of poetry for the field of the oh, novel, no, are you? Oh, no, no. I, I doubt very much if I'll write any more novels. And uh, I don't, I don't uh, feel any compulsion to, to get on the great novelistic uh, hit parade where I have to have a bestseller every four years. And uh, it's like Bill Styron, my great admirer, or Philip Roth, Roth, you know, or any of those people. I don't, I don't uh, feel any, any such commitment as that. Tell me how it felt as a poet to be writing a novel. Did you find it more difficult than you anticipated or a great deal different from writing, say, a long poem? No, in, in some ways it's, it's similar, but I think if you, if you have the commitment to write poetry, which is the most difficult of all verbal forms, uh, then other writing is comparatively easy. I don't mean it's easy. I mean, I don't mean to slight the novel yeah. form at all. Yeah. But compared to the difficulties of poetry, that is the self-imposed difficulties of poetry, it's, it's easier than that. Well, was there more rewriting, for example, in, in your poetry? Well, I just, a wrote, great deal more I just wrote, it, uh, okay. wrote Deliverance like I would r have written a poem. I just drafted it and redrafted it and changed it and drafted it and drafted it one time after another. Except that the difficulty about it, uh, uh, as far as the novel, his concern is that is that uh, uh, the sheer bulk of the novel makes it difficult because you, in a poem, you have it on all on one page and you can look at it, or two pages or three, and you can look at it and you can tell where things are in relation to each other. Uh, one of the more difficult things about the novel is that, or at least for me, that was that was that you say on page. You know, page 234, such and such a thing, and then you've got to go back to page 14 and, and, and then check. And, and verify it. And verify it, yeah. yeah. And th there are those problems. Well, did you keep, uh, keep a description of your characters, for instance, so you wouldn't call one uh, tall or short or blue-eyed or something <laughs> whom you'd called something different before? Uh, well, no, I didn't, I didn't have any systematic way of doing it, no. I wondered if you had, no. had that <laughs> at all. You're, you won in 66 the uh, National Book Award. Uh-huh, for poetry. Yeah. And that was one of how many books of poetry you've done? Uh, that was, I think, the fourth one that I had done, and I've done uh, two since then. Well, did you start writing overseas, or had you written before you went into the uh, Air Corps? No, I, I wrote, uh, I'm very much, as far as uh, Im imaginatively is concerned, I, I was very much a creature of the service years. You did begin in New Guinea, right? Well, or I in think, the army well, at least. Yeah, in the in army. The or, oh, as nearly as I can remember. Uh, of course, this is this is a matter of. Uh, let's say it would be in 1943, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a good. Long. How long is that? 20, 27, Twenty-seven years. years uh -huh. So, so naturally, your memory is a little bit uh, uh, erroneous. I mean, you can't I'd be absolutely sure. Yeah. But I think really that I began to write 
uh, as a result of writing uh, long erotic letters home to girls from overseas. <laughs> you know? That's very I funny. I think that really is what, where I started. That's very funny. Uh, and uh, I, I think I was really born as a writer. Now, when I was writing one of these letters, I don't know who the girl was, who, sh who shall be forever nameless, <laughs> you know? And I, and, I, and I looked at what I'd written, and I, did, I, I didn't say, as I usually would have said, gee, this will have the desired effect, should I ever, ever get back home, you know? <laughs> when I looked at what I'd written, and I didn't say that at all, I said, goodness, that's not bad, <laughs> you know? See, I got interested in the thing itself. It's of very of funny. Ul ulterior, some kind of ulterior motive. Uh, is it fair to ask if your wife, whom I have met, was one of the girls you were writing oh, to? Oh, no. No, no. She hadn't been met then. <laughs> then she has none of those erotic letters from overseas. No, no, no. Only from, only from uh, mail from within the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you an athlete in college? Yes, I was a fad of Midland. What did yeah. you, you play, football? Or? Uh, yeah, I played wing back for Frank Howard at Clemson. Uh, the old single wing system, and I, I was inel ineligible when I came back from the service, and I changed schools. I went to Vanderbilt, and I ran the. I was, but I was eligible for track, so I ran on the uh, high hurdles and the, on the, and the 100 and 220 on the track team. See, so you're kind of hard to categorize an athlete and a night fighter pilot who turns out to be a poet. Well, I, I think there's. Uh, I, I think you should throw a wide net and do a lot of things. Uh, England, of course, I could imagine it, but. Uh, you don't don't fit the bill of most of our athletes, it seems to me. Well, the Eng English athletes are not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a good wingback? Back? Like I was. <laughs> I would have been great in England. <laughs> Do you have any any? Yeah, I was fair. I think a little. I had my moments. <laughs> Do you have any gr any aim in poetry? Is there something you want to do in poetry that you haven't done yet? Oh yes. Yeah. So you ha you always have to have to n nurture the illusion in yourself that you can do something that really has never been done before. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of a, of a will-o'-the-wisp uh, dream that every writer has that he can do. He can, he can say it, mm. you know, the ultimate, you know. What about narrative? You haven't done a long narrative poem, have you? Uh, well, uh, in a way, uh, most, most of my poems have a narrative element of some sort. Yeah, but I mean they're not long. Uh, no, no, no. I'm thinking of Edward Arlington Robinson, for Oh, example. nothing like that. You know, um, a full book. Uh, no, no, I'm a great admirer of his, though. So am I. I like I'd it. edited uh, in a selection of his, his work and wrote a long introduction. I like his images and, and his, and his uh, phraseology very much. Yeah, he's a, he's a great man to me. Marvelous man with words. Yes. What do you think, by the way, of uh, the state of poetry today? Well, uh, there are very good poets around. I mean, they 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 don't they don't seem to be any really big figures who can really transfigure the sensibility, you know. But there are very many competent workmen and and uh, people of of uh, imagination and honor. But no great. There, there don't seem to be any great uh, uh, poets who can who can simply remake uh, the human sensibility. Isn't there uh, possibly an over-tendency to uh, do uh, free form and uh, free verse? Oh, yes. And, uh, I, I, th I think if I had any objection, uh, central objection to uh, uh, most of what I read, it's, it's the fact that they, the person doesn't seem to have any individual or, or characteristic rhythm to what he writes. Uh, they all seem to be writing each other's poems. And no discipline. Well, some of them have that, but maybe it's the dis discipline of the wrong sort. Uh, no, I, I mean metrical discipline, you know, uh, uh, yeah. making things well, fit that, in the... There are no form. Robinsons around. That's for sure. <laughs> Do you have a favorite uh, poet by the... Is Robinson your favorite? Well, no, or he's one not. Of your favorites? No, he's a... I, I like him. I respect him very much, and and I think he's a great poet. But uh, somebody said of Robinson's line, "There's a there's a little too much iron in it and not enough gold." <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh yes, I think uh, the late Theodore Retke is probably the greatest American poet. He surely is to me. Uh, and uh, I think I think uh, Hart Crane is a great poet. Some of Eliot is great, but the the poet that I really think. Uh, has more to say, and uh, really it means more to, pe to the people who read him, 
is Randall Jarrell. Oh, yes. He was unfortunately killed quite young in an auto accident, wasn't he? Well, he was 52, and I think he was, uh, uh, there was I don't know how he was killed, but I don't, I don't want to ask. Oh, I thought it was an auto accident. Well, it was. It oh, was I killed by an yeah. au automobile, but I don't, the circumstances somehow I don't want to ask. Oh. Oh, well, that's a shame. Uh, because you're right, he was uh, an excellent man. Yeah, but he's, he's uh, as Robert Lowell says, he was a wonderful poet, a tragic poet. And, uh, as he says, Randall Jarrell was the most heartbreaking of all our poets. That's uh, a nice phrase. Yes, yeah, the most heartbreaking poet. That's, you can't read Randall Jarrell without saying, oh, yes, he's so right at what he says. It takes a poet of a very great amount of imagination uh, to use uh, the names of detergents uh, and make a marvelous first line of a poem out of the names of de detergents in a supermarket. I move from cheer to joy, from joy to all. You know? <laughs> That's wonderful. Isn't that great? I don't know that one yet. No, it's, it's great. That's beautiful. But I mean, those, are re those really are the yeah. names. Yeah, I know they are, yes. <laughs> I know they are. <laughs> no detergents. Have you taught uh, courses in poetry? Well, I, yes, I have and do. What do you tell your students? I mean, oh, is it I possible think, to develop a poet to, to start I, from well, scratch? I tell and them about them different things and do every, every day, different things, whatever comes into my mind. Yes, well, I, I, think, um, I think you can show uh, a reasonably intelligent person who is devoted to writing and who, and who has a commitment, a, a personal and emotional commitment to writing. I think you can, you can save them some time and, and show them some things. Sure, I do. But, they but you, can't, you can't give them the essential ingredient that it takes to make a poet, which is an original way of looking at, at existence. And an ear, I think, maybe. Yes, and, the, and maybe that, too. Yeah, yeah, I think you should have the but ear. But you know, if you ever played a musical instrument, you know that a lifelong of devotion and uh, a, a, a great deal of playing every day uh, will give you a better pitch. I mean, you, you will improve somewhat. I mean, if you play the guitar for 10 years, you can tune it pretty well accurately, you know. But that doesn't give you the command of the instrument and the, and the sense of, of musical drama, you know, which makes a great yeah. musician. The yeah. same thing is true of poetry. We better get back to deliverance. We've gotten off on your poetry, and we're supposed to be talking yeah. about your novel. Oh, well, I, don't, I don't mind that, I, uh, <laughs> because it's what you, exactly as you said earlier, that my, my essential... Uh, pitch is uh, bag, as they'd say, is poetry. Did you take people by surprise with the novel? Oh, I don't know. You'd have to. I don't have to know. Well, I mean, what about your wife, is. for example? Was she surprised to discover you were writing a novel? No, she she enjoyed it. But I mean, she's like anybody else. She likes to read prose rather than poetry. Uh, the the concentration of poetry and is is a bit too much for most people, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the people the people who love it and like it can't have enough of it. But generally, they would rather go with, with a narrative, something with a story, like the novel. But oddly enough, not the short story. People don't read short stories. Are they going out of fashion? I'm a Kenneth Fearing man, by the way. Yes, like I, Kenneth like, yes, I, yes I knew him very well. There yes. was a man with an ear. Yes, and he was quite a good uh, uh, suspense novel Excellent. writer. Excellent. The Big Clock. Da Dagger of the Mind. Yeah, and The Big Clock. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, you mentioned that the Deliverance has, has been sold to the movies. Yes. Has it been cast? It hasn't been cast, no. Nobody signed anything as far as the casting of the director is concerned. Well, the book, as I said before, builds because it starts quietly with this, this pleasant little it trip. It starts just like you and I sitting here. Yeah, and then... If uh, we had a map and we pull it out, put it out on this table, that would be the beginning of deliverance. And let's go here, and yeah, I happen well, to know yeah, this little right. logging camp, and we could... That's yeah, right. sure. sure. That's the way it starts. Uh-huh. How about the uh, the uh, small towns? Were those you mentioned? When, for instance, when oh, they, they, came all, down, they all they are also sort of composite towns. They're just any southern small town. You know? I I I don't really know the southern lawman, but I was I was very amused and pleased with the with the the ones you turned up because there was one very nasty one. And a very gentle sheriff who yes. just wanted them to get out. He thought yes. there might be something funny, but he wasn't really concerned, and he wanted that's them right. to get out of town. That's right, and let's let it go, because there's nothing we can hold them for, and let's get it over with. We didn't find any bodies, and these fellows are, are hurt pretty badly, and they're tired, and let's let them go. He was, he was a fine character. How long did it take you to do Deliverance? Oh, uh, I started in 62 and finished it last fall, but... I wrote uh, five or six other books during the same time, so 
<clears throat> I can't say that I worked on that steadily all the time and to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, I, I just built it up a little at a time, and and when Houghton Mifflin uh, indicated an interest in publishing it, uh, I, f I figured that, I, well, I was going to have to finish it, you know, because <laughs> I sent to him for a modest advance, and <clears throat> I figured, but toward the end, when I saw that it really would be possible to finish it, mm -hmm. then I then it sort of took hold, and, and, I, and I rammed it on through. I got terrifically excited about finishing it. Do you realize that with this on your record, you could now be into them for an, I for an immodest advance? Well, I don't know. I don't. I didn't do it for that reason, man. Yeah, but uh, think what you could get out of them now. Well, it's, it's selling so much now. My gracious me! The number one in Chicago, Washington, Philadelphia, and all of that. I mean, gracious! I I don't want to, you know, be hoggy about it. <laughs> you but know? you sound pleased. Well, who wouldn't be? Certainly. Yeah. Does it dismay you at all that this book will probably outsell all your poems? Oh, it doesn't dismay me, but I'd, I'd like to think that it'll induce at least a few readers to read the poems, too. To go back to them. As yeah. they say in North Georgia, there ain't nothing says you can't have it both ways. <laughs> Where are you from, by the way? You're not from Georgia, are you? Yes, I am from Oh, you are? Yeah, You're I live now in South, South Carolina. Carolina. Carolina now. Yeah. Uh -huh. But you were born in Georgia. Yes. Uh-huh. This is an awful jump, but it suddenly occurred to me that I don't know much about night fighter pilots. Did you shoot down any planes? Yeah, I shot down some planes. Did yeah, you? Sure, sure. Uh, but it was we, all instrument, you know, maybe. As a poet, how do you feel shooting down planes? You don't see Does anything. I wrote, I wrote a long poem called The Fire Bombing, about air kills and also about bombing. Uh, as, as Mr. Orden says, the... The horrifying thing about modern air warfare is that you the, you don't see the results the of what you do. Detachment of it, yeah. It's the detachment, yeah. and that's even more now when a person would press a button and send an ICBM continents away. I mean, you don't you don't have to be held responsible for the human carnage because you never see it. But you, of course, are very much against uh, against war. As I don't know. I don't like to kill. I don't think. I think it's wrong. I don't want to see anybody That's get killed. That's what I killed. mean. Yeah, I say Human it. life is infinitely precious. As a poet, especially. Or as any anything, as a, as a human being, it's infinitely precious. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I, certainly not. Uh, I, I I deplore all that. It's terrible. You know, it's very funny. A 19th century English poet named John Davidson whom nobody has ever read except me and John Davidson, uh, said uh, was an atheist uh, poet, and this is in the tag end of the Victorian era, you know. <clears throat> and somebody said uh, to John Davidson, didn't he believe that being an atheist made and, belie and believe that human beings on this little tiny speck of gr dust that we are on... Uh, with no God or anything of that sort, didn't that diminish human beings to uh, a negligible uh, kind of, uh, you know, sense? Proportions, yeah. Proportions, yeah. yes. He said, not at all. I don't believe there's any other life anywhere else in the universe, and neither do I, personally. I mean, I quite agree with John Davidson on that. I don't think there's anything. We're not going to find anything on Mars. No, if we get certainly there. not. Then, or anywhere else. Why do you base... Uh, what do well, you I don't know. It's just a private conviction. But d what Davidson went on to say is it's something I quite agree with. Rather than diminishing man, the stature of man, it makes him infinitely precious. That's right. It increases it. Infinitely yeah. precious. Because in the sensibility of man and the intelligence of man uh, is, is, the, is the only consciousness that the universe has of itself. Yeah, Mr. Ben, I wasn't very surprised to find out that there was no life on the moon. Oh, not everybody knew that. I wasn't totally convinced that it wouldn't be something as I'm, you know, like in 2001. Yeah, I was disappointed, like though. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but Mars is going to be the same way. Venus is in another. Venus is going to be dead in another way, but it's going to be equally dead. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, they're all going to be dead. Well, now, they've, dead. they've diminished the moon, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. They've certainly dealt a, a mortal blow to poets. Well, they have and they have, because I, I've been writing a lot about the moon, you know, and about these. I disappeared with Aldrin uh, last Monday in New York, and we had a long metaphysical discussion about the moon and implications for the sensibility of man and all that, and I, I just wrote the uh, Phi Beta Kappa poem for the the uh, graduation at Harvard, which I'll do in a few days. 
Mm -hmm. it's, it, that, that's also about space exploration. And actually, the, the Phi Beta Kappa poem is, uh, is, is really about um, um, pollution, love, death, space exploration, and country music. That's <laughs> what I call a timely occasional yeah. poem. Right. I hope. <laughs> Have you done these before? Oh no, this is this is the only only uh, one I'm going to do like that. I think. I would think it would be hard. It's almost like writing on command, isn't it? Well, it isn't because they just tell me to write anything I oh, want. I see. But it's like I remember when I read an interview with J. Robert Robert Oppenheimer, who had the Princeton uh, Institute yeah, for Advanced yeah. Studies, and he says we get all these high, you know, high uh, level minds up here and. Who've said all their lives that they, if they had time, we were going to we, they, they were going to write this monumental work. Yeah. He says we, we bring them up here and we say well, you've got time. They're terrified. They don't. We have no time. We've been talking with James Dickey, author of Deliverance, published by Horton Mifflin, a very fine novel. I'm Bob Crumby from the Chicago Tribune. And thank you for coming. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right.